Hey everyone, welcome to the PC Perspective Mailbag. This is uh, episode number 37, being recorded on March 29th, 2018. Uh, I'm Alan Malventano. I'm going to cover a few questions. Uh, it'll be a short one this week. We only have a small handful of questions. It's not Ryan this time. He's uh, out somewhere doing some stuff. I don't even, I don't even know where anymore. Uh, he'll be back next week, though. I'm pretty sure. Um... Let's get right into it. Uh, Trolling for Dollars asks, uh, with Ryzen needing fast memory, which is more important, rated speed or the timings? I have noticed that as uh, the RAM speed goes up, the timings go up as well. What is a good balance? So, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, generally speaking, as the uh, speed of the RAM goes up, usually they back off on the timings. In other words, the timings are generally like higher numbers, slightly higher numbers, meaning that they're waiting more of those faster clocks before the data is either ready or uh, waiting a few extra clocks for the address to be present on the bus or, you know, just the different things that need to happen in the sequence of trying to read or write uh, from or to some some DRAM. Um, so we've actually, uh, for Ryzen, first of all, I would recommend always going as high of a speed as you can get it to go. Uh, so if you have RAM that's, you know, uh, comes uh, advertised as, say, DDR3200 or something like that, uh, as long as your board will support it, uh, just realize that RAM that comes at that rating won't necessarily run at that speed out of the box. That's not the motherboard's fault. That's just RAM will come with a default speed uh, that's set generally lower than, than what its uh, maximum rating is. Uh, so you have to go in your BIOS, you have to select an XMP profile, which will be part of, you know, it's stored on the DRAM. Um, you have to manually kind of like set your system to do that. Um, once you're there, uh, or if that number is not fast enough for you, uh, you can kind of do some math. And this this works most of the time, As again, as long as the motherboard supports it and as long as you're not venturing into just the system being unstable just because you're pushing the, the RAM clock uh, too high. But you can see what all those timing numbers look like at the default numbers. Uh, if your BIOS lets you go in and actually see like what's all the 1T, 2T, um, you know, CAS, RAS, latency, all those different variables. Um, you can check out what those numbers are not using the XMP profile. And then for the XMP profile, see what those timings become. And kind of proportionally... Uh, scale all those timing numbers with the frequency increase. So if the frequency all goes up by 20% and you look at timings, you'll notice that the timings will probably increase by about the same, maybe with a couple, one or two exceptions. Uh, you can use that as a gauge and maybe even try to push those clocks even higher than what the XMP profile uh, provides you. Um, and you're more likely to get away with the higher frequency if you also increase those timings proportionally. Uh, the end goal is that you're still giving the RAM the same amount of time to respond to something. It's just that once the data is actually being clocked across the bus, either in or out, um, it that goes at a faster rate, right? Um, you can get away with that going faster a lot more than you can get away with giving the RAM less time to respond to the request, right? So that's what your timings are. Um, so you can play around with that. Um, honestly, if you're into overclocking, you're probably just going to be pushing those things as high as you can go. Um, with Ryzen CPUs, I would recommend, since the Infinity Fabric inside the Ryzen CPU is a proportional clock rate to the, to the DRAM clock, um, always go for that XMP profile. Always go, at least get yourself as high as you can on that clock rate, provided that that motherboard supports it at that frequency and, and your system runs stable. And if you're willing to dabble a little bit, maybe push it a little harder and, again, back off on the on the timing some. The timings thing is, is really, I mean, if you're, if you're asking about what's a good balance, the good balance is always just whatever stable, right? Um, you know, if you can get away with just doubling the clock rate of the DRAM and you didn't have to change timings and, and somehow it worked, then uh, sure, you know, just go for it. But um, it's a lot more likely that you can get away with that if uh, you can you can kind of back off um, on the timings a little bit and, and give that uh, give the RAM a little bit more time to respond. Um, there's a whole bunch more on that topic if you really, you know, Google around, dig around on the internet for different
different like what the timings actually mean and 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 all that stuff it's actually kind of interesting there's like row and column strobes and all sorts of different nitty-gritty things there's different timings that you might not even have to proportionally scale up and you could still get away with uh you know running at a higher frequency but if you want to keep it simple do the xmp profile cross your fingers hope the motherboard's stable with it uh go after dram that's um advertised as being you know better compatibility with ryzen like there is some of that that i've seen come out um things like that uh woot doctor asks uh could gpu manufacturers include something like a chronometer in each card that could securely measure the card's overall uptime and number of hours at high load this would make it possible for secondhand uh purchasers to know how hard the cards were pushed by previous owners and miners and let them make more informed decisions about their purchase so there's a couple parts to this. First, could they? I'm sure they could. Uh, it wouldn't be that hard. Um, they might have to do something different with the BIOS of the GPU because GPUs as they stand right now, I don't believe that they rewrite any part of their firmware unless you're explicitly updating firmware. Um, so trying to do something where you're constantly updating a number that needs to be like a persistent number and not get lost whenever the, the cart loses power you might get into just tricky things like they might have to source different types of uh, EPROMs, different types of, you know, places to store firmware that are a little bit more robust or at least have an area that can be updated more frequently. Um, computers don't even like doing that to the EPROM. Like, usually when you change your BIOS settings, that'll be changed and stored in EPROM and it will be something that updated. But to, to the lot of extent, things that are updated frequently, that's the reason you have a battery. Uh, you know, a CMOS battery on your motherboard because the battery is what makes it non-volatile, not so much the fact that you're overwriting continuously a section of memory that's uh, persistent, right? It's just, it's more like RAM. It's just made persistent by a battery. I don't know if we want GPU vendors to start putting batteries on their GPUs, and if they were just to store this number, then that's going to defeat the whole purpose of, you know, securely st storing the number like an odometer of a car in such a way that, uh, you know that it wouldn't be uh that it wouldn't be easily erased and reset to zero so that's part one uh part two is if you actually you actually have to kind of understand and look at how electronic components will fail so uh, step away from gpus for a second go with like hard drives or like other just you know if you just google around look for like failure rates of like power circuitry or just mosfets or transistors in general um there's a certain kind of curve that they will generally follow. Uh, you'll have, if it, you'll have basically, if it was going to fail, like the simple way to think about it is if it was going to fail under load, like at its normal operating temperature, uh, or in the case of a GPU at its, you know, rated operating temperature when the GPU is actually doing some work, uh, a part, you'll have this kind of like a bump or, or, you know, kind of like spike at the beginning. Uh, it's called infant mortality, right? If you, generally speaking electronic components uh they're going to fail within a month or two like of continuous use uh if they don't by then then chances are now you're just getting into your your failure rates uh you know spread out over a periods of years right but uh the defects are going to tend to come out soon um now that actually kind of puts things like backwards for the whole mining thing in other words me personally if i was buying a gpu as long as the gpu was clean and wasn't like run in the super dusty environment or something like that or things that might have messed up the fan bearings or just you know outside of those kinds of mechanical and just like appearance things um if the card was run hard for a few months versus if the card sat idle for a few months I'm more likely, just based on what I know of electronics, I'm kind of going to trust the one that was run hard for a couple months. Um, just because if it was going to break due to like power circuitry defects or whatnot, it would have happened. Like the chances are pretty high after a couple months that if it was the defective, it, it would have already been RMA'd out and swapped for another one or something like that. Um, now, We've done some mining at the office. Actually, we still have some GPUs mining there. Um, probably not can, not for long since the profitability is not looking that great anymore. But uh, I think of all the GPUs we had mining at the office, I don't, I'm don't. i not sure that we actually had any go, had any fail on us. Um, 
I've been doing some GPU mining just with GPUs in my systems in the house and stuff like that. Um, I had, I, I bought a round of GPUs to do some mining like way, way back, like middle of last year or something like that. Um, and after like it was within a month or two, some of them failed. Like, you know, it was a small percentage. It was like a couple percentages failed. Like your typical failure rate percentage of electronic stuff, actually, uh, is what the number ended up working out to. Um, but over the course of like, you know, now it's like February, March. Um, you know, I've had them running since like April or something like that. Um, there was only that small batch that, that failed towards the beginning, and that was it. Every, every other GPU is there, is still running. Um, so... You know, and I would have any issues taking taking those and like if I wanted to upgrade my main system here and stick one of the faster GPUs in there, I'd I would do it without even hesitation um, because I'm pretty sure that they're past that whole infant mortality point where you know uh, if they were gonna fail, then they would have failed by now. So take that for what you will. Um, I don't I don't know if GPU makers would actually ever do something like that, but even if they did, I'm not sure. Like at least me personally, I'm not sure how that number would sway my choice of, of purchasing a used GPU either way. Um, but that's just me. Uh, other people might, you know, be more sensitive to it for whatever reason you may have. Maybe you didn't like the fact that the GPU was running with the fans spinning faster for that much time and you're concerned that the maybe the fans won't have as much life, which I can't really speak to. I haven't had a, I haven't had a GPU fan failure like ever. Uh, and the only time I've had fan failures in general, it's just been like dust got in there, like on a CPU fan and clogged it up and it didn't want to spin anymore. Um, but that's, that's my take on it. Um, Tammy Thomas, uh, as a question, I have a SanDisk Ultra 3D one terabyte SSD, which is a SATA SSD and a, uh, Samsung 860 Evo one terabyte, uh, which drive would be the best slash fastest to use as a windows 10 boot drive with, uh, the other one to be used for games. Uh, so based on what I know of those and the responsiveness and just like how fast uh, the read latencies are, uh, like random read performance, um, in other words, the things that you're going to look for for responsiveness and like your OS kind of duties, I would lean towards the 860 Evo um, just for your OS drive. And then I would do uh, use a SanDisk Ultra for all your games. Um, you're you're kind of splitting hairs there, but I, I believe that for an OS drive, the 860 is... Uh, slightly faster drive they're both good though um kangaroo asks why are there no dedicated monitors monitors like the surface studio uh when the surface studio first launched everyone agreed that although the integrated pc hardware was subpar yeah that's true um display itself was exceptional apart from panel costs is there a reason that the market is going for ultra wides instead of the surface studio's more usable three to two aspect ratio uh, I feel your pain. I'm totally there with you. I see Jim just reviewed a ultra wide recently that was a taller aspect. So granted it was still an ultra wide, but it gave you some more vertical height and he claimed it for that. Um, I still to this day, actually on that desk over there, uh, cause I refuse to get rid of it, have an old, um, Dell, uh, 20, what was it? 2560 by, 1600 display not by 1440 um nice 30-inch panel i refuse to get rid of that um uh, because it just gives you you know more vertical space um granted now i've kind of like uh capitulated and now i have a uh, i have an ultra wide on on my desk in front of me but my secondary screen is just a regular like 16 by 9 screen but i only have those because i wanted to have a g-sync panel of a, of a decent refresh rate and I just wanted more screen real estate and that's really all I could get that gave me a, a large area of screen right when I'm doing my SSD reviews and I have spreadsheets that have the you know insane rows and columns and all the data I'm trying to compile um, I just needed more space um, at work I have a um, I forget who makes it um, but at work I have a 40 inch uh, 4k panel um, by Seiki, actually. It's the Seiki Pro. Um, great panel there. Uh, again, it is a 16 by 9 uh, aspect ratio, but it's enormous, so you know you, you almost have too much vertical height for that one. 
given the size of the display. But yeah, I'm I'm totally with you on uh, you know why are there not more of these three by twos aspect ratios? Uh, I think the problem is that you you like just the general person. Not like the power user, but the general consensus of people are just like 16 by 9 aspect better because when they watch a movie or whatnot on it and want to be able to full screen it, you're you know you're getting a, a a nice wide screen. Now, if they would make these things bigger, then it wouldn't matter in the end because you'd have more vertical space anyway because the whole screen would be huge. But again, now the screen's huge and now it's expensive, so now it takes it out of the realm of like your typical purchaser, right? Um, so yeah, I think we're kind of stuck with, you know, 21, 24 inch or so 16 by 9 panels um, for a while. And then ultra wides appear to be the thing that's catching on better or faster. Um, so that's just the way things are going. I think I think once this next round of like FreeSync 2 panels start coming out and um, higher refresh rate, uh, G-Sync panels start coming out. I think you'll start seeing like some larger 4K panels. And so again, you're going back to 16 by 9, I know. But at least you could be getting 4K and higher refresh rates and things like that. Um, but yeah, still not still not that nice uh, Surface Studio panel, um, unfortunately. I really like that design myself. But pretty much all of us, I think, at the, at the site, like as soon as we saw that come out, we're like, amazing panel, but... And then, you know, that hardware is going to almost immediately be outdated just like most other PC hardware, except for the display. Displays have, you know, more life to them. But yeah, uh, I don't know what the right answer is there as far as like, is it going to happen soon? I haven't seen anything. I'm, I will remain just as hopeful as you are and we can all keep our collective fingers crossed and maybe we'll get something like that in the future. Nice big three by two display. Uh, I don't know how to say that name. Uh, us or us hot my monkey. Interesting. Oh, you shot my monkey. Ha <laughs> ha. I was, I was reading that completely wrong. I did not shoot your monkey, but I will answer your question. Um, I'm building a new micro ATX PC on the X299 platform. When considering my storage options, what would be best? A 58 gig Optane 800P compared with a 1 terabyte Samsung 960 Evo or just using a 1 terabyte Samsung 960 Pro. Uh, at current prices, both options are about $600. The system will be used for gaming, general productivity, and moderately advanced photo slash video editing. So X299, so you're not going to be able to... Okay, so realize you have to be on a Z... Uh, 370-ish type platform. If you plan to use that Optane drive as a cache for the other drive, that will not work with an NVMe SSD. So if you're trying to do that, that's, an, that's a no-go. If you're just going to have the drive separate, um, that's okay too. I would probably recommend going with the 118 gig um, 800p if you can get away with it just because it's going to give you a little bit more room like if you're trying to cram your OS and at least a few things just onto an 800p that's only 58 gig you're, you're kind of cutting it tight on your capacity there um, now to switch gears and go between a 1 terabyte Samsung 960 Evo or a 1 terabyte Samsung 960 Pro I would recommend the Evo 9 times out of 10 uh, the only real reason I would recommend the Pro is if you're worried about the endurance and you needed the almost, like I think the number is almost doubles when you go to the 960 Pro because it uses MLC instead of TLC for its flash. But uh, generally speaking, the speeds are almost identical, um, especially when it comes to just doing any kind of normal activity on the PC. Um, if you look at our review of the 960 Evo and 960 Pro, you'll you'll see that they basically sit... In most of the charts, they're sitting right next to each other, unless you're looking at a smaller capacity Evo where the write speed, if you were to continuously write to it and you run out of your SLC cache, then you start seeing slowdowns. But again, typical use, you're never going to run out of cache um, on the drive. So for the vast majority of any kind of use case, even for power users, uh, pretty much always go with the Evo. 
unless you're really, really worried about the endurance. Um, so now that part's out of the way. Um, so it sounds like you are, you're impressed with the Optane part and you want the responsiveness of it. Um, just remember, uh, it will give you that. It will feel a little bit snappier. Now realize, uh, you know, 960 Evo is pretty quick drive too. Um, so you could very well be happy with only a 960 Evo as your drive for your system. Uh, and it'll probably do pretty well. Um, bear in mind on an X2 X299, if you're trying to use uh, VROC, which is how it does a RAID, um, that 960 Evo or 960 Pro is not on Intel's whitelist. So even if you decided to start doing like multiples of drives, um, of the 960s at least, uh, it's not going to be compatible with VROC because uh, Intel has just decided not to validate that, that particular line um, with their X299 style RAID. Now, why am I telling you that? That's because if you bought one 960 Evo and maybe later on you decide, well, I've got this system, it could do this VROC RAID thing, and I could just take and just buy, pick up another one of these drives and make it into a RAID. Uh, no, you can't. Um, so you would have to get a little creative and look into the OEM um, versions of those drives, which actually are on Intel's whitelist for having a, um, for setting up a, a RAID 0 of multiple of them. Um, those are the SM and the PM drives, like the 961. I think it's SM 961, PM 961. Um, I will, after I've done recording this, I'll look up the, uh, there's a forum post or something where Intel lists off what the whitelisted drives are, just so you know which ones to look for. Um, and he can stick a link like somewhere over here. And uh, just so you know, or actually should just like post it on the YouTube comments or something like that, or the YouTube uh, video description. Um, all right, so again, where does that put you? Um, if you're really after the Optane thing and like the responsiveness of it, but you only want to buy a small one, maybe maybe consider a 270 platform or just, well, yeah, 270 or 370 platform. Make sure it's a platform that supports the Optane caching. Uh, get yourself an 800p or just the Optane memory part. The 58 gig 800p part also does work as if it was an Optane memory cache. And when you do all that, uh, and you're trying to like be more um, cost-saving, then uh, since that drive would be caching the entire other potentially SSD, it's meant to cache hard drives, but you can also uh, cache a SATA SSD, save yourself some more money, get yourself a 860 Evo, one terabyte. Um, so now you've got, it's a bit of a you know different configuration than you were looking at, but you could potentially have an Optane memory cache on a SATA SSD. SATA SSD can be large. Maybe with the money you save by dropping to a SATA part, you could buy a two terabyte, um, 860 Evo, something like that. Um, honestly though, uh, based on our testing of Optane memory, don't even get the 58 gig 800p, get just the 32 gig Optane memory part, which is probably a decent amount cheaper than the, 800, than the 800p since the 800p pricing seemed higher than it should have been when we when we uh, covered them at their launch. Um, so again, if you're kind of hooked on the Optane memory idea, get the 32 gig part, make sure your motherboard supports Optane memory caching. Uh, get a, get a, the, with the money you saved, get a larger um, 860 Evo or something like that on SATA. Um, hook those two up as a cache and you'll have a pretty darn quick uh, system with uh, you know twice the storage all on SSD. Um, so there's another another avenue you can, you can look at. If you're dead set on the X299 platform because of your CPU choice and whatnot, you're just going to have to deal with uh, the limitations of VROC um, and the fact that it only works with OEM-style drives. And remember, even if you wanted to do that, the only way that that, is, that, that works uh, and is supported properly is as long as you're using non-Intel drives, in this case you would be because you're trying to raid together 960s in the future or something like that, um, the only way that works uh, is with the VROC premium key. And again, it doesn't work with 960s. It works with the OEM equivalent of 960s. That's a big headache and a big mouthful, and it's a big 
you know, it's it's one of uh, my sticking points as well as many of the other um, storage editors in 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 my field. We just have like some bones to pick with VRock in general because it's it's a great idea on paper, but it's something that was designed and meant for the enterprise space. So it's not so much Intel's fault on that because they didn't really they're not really trying to push it for consumers. The problem is that the motherboard makers are. Um, and they're kind of forcing Intel into like, okay, well, maybe now Intel has to rethink that and make it work with, uh, you know, drives like these 960s in the future. But at the moment, it's just it's just a mess. Um, it's a mess on both sides. AMD's RAID stuff uh, has a bunch of other kind of quirks to it that, you know, makes it really hard to get the performance out of it that you're looking for. So the, the VROC thing performs great. You turn it on, it just works. It's just that there's all these requirements that you have to, you know, you can only use certain kinds of drives and whatnot. AMD side is kind of like if getting it to perform as advertised is tricky. And there's a bunch of different bells and whistles and little bio switches you have to flip and configuration changes to make a to make it go as fast as it should. But it works with pretty much all the drives you can throw at it. So just maybe not goes maybe not going as fast. Anyway, uh, that's it for this one i guess uh sorry my voice is a little bit uh on the edge there i've had like a head cold for over a week and uh, apparently it's moved to my my throat so anyway i'll wrap this one up uh if you have any questions for us uh maybe not answered by me but maybe by josh or ryan or anybody else who happens to do a mail mailbag for that week um leave your questions in either the comment section of this video on youtube or in the comments of the article as it's posted on uh, PC Per, and we'll get to them, and we'll uh, we'll try and do our best to to answer them for you. That's it for me, and uh, I guess we'll see you guys on the next episode of whatever it is you watch from us. Good night.